Welcome. My name is Adil Najam. I am the Dean of the Frederick S. Pardee uh, School of Global Studies here at Boston University. It is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to our alumni weekend and to the first of our set of three seminars that we'll be doing, one today and the next two on the next two days, called The World in Flux. And because the world is in so much flux, uh, we are going to talk about this over three days. Today, in this hour, we'll be talking to my colleagues from the party school about the world in flux in terms of the future of global politics. Tomorrow, I am joined by a different set of colleagues and we'll be talking about the future of global economics. And then on Sunday, same time, same place, we will be joined by a third set of colleagues who will be talking and discussing what the future of global values, of rights, of social movements, is in this moment that is being defined by COVID. Um, let me just very briefly say who is with me. With me today are three wonderful colleagues from the Party School of Global Studies, Professor Kaya Shilde, Professor Josh Schifrensen, and Professor Nora Laurie. And we'll be hearing about them, what they think the happening is happening to the world. And we'll be hearing from them about what they think might be happening to the world as we go into this uncharted future. But before we do that, uh, I wanted to introduce you to a series that we've been doing since March, since late March. Uh, one of our centers, the Party Center for the Study of the Longer Term Future, has been talking to world experts around the, around the world. Uh, leading policymakers, leading think, uh, thinkers, leading scholars, leading politicians, uh, and, 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 and sort of big thinkers, and asking them what the world after COVID might look like. And we've put for you a short, just over two minute collage of some of the things that we've been hearing from these big thinkers. So let us start by showing you that as, as, as the spicing on the conversation to follow. I've never seen a period in which the degree of uncertainty as to what the world will look like uh, politically is greater than it is today. What COVID-19 has done is to confirm the long-term trend of the return of Asia. Human society and history tends to pick up on three or four different topics that affect us all. One is disease. It's, a, it's part of our global history. One is on climate. One is natural resources, uh, and one is on demographics. So right now, China sits in the middle of all of those kinds of questions. COVID-19 really revealed, I think, a number of uncomfortable truths uh, about the United States and China and uh, their relationship. Underlying fundamental structural lucidity and rivalry in which a rapidly rising China is seriously threatening to displace the U.S. Security. The EU is in a very bad neighborhood, and that also links to the migrant and refugee crisis. One of the effects that we see is fear of migrants ramping up. I have been surprised how suddenly we are now concerned more about how many masks a country has as opposed to how much oil or energy. There should be uh, a conversation about what is, what should be, the definition of national security in the 21st century. I think for the United States, alliances become more important. NATO becomes more important. It's very clear that because of COVID, the United States is going to leave the Middle East. We have to expect that some governments in the Middle East will fall. Already, we've seen a number of African countries that have suspended uh, elections. And I, I can promise you, I can guarantee you that there, there will be many more countries in 2020 that, that do suspend their, their elections. This U.S. election is the most important exercise of the democratic franchise anywhere in the world, I would say, for the last 90 years at least. It's embarrassing how terribly America has addressed this problem. I think it's very important for the next president of the United States to really try to heal what has happened to our country. The world after COVID is going to look an awful lot like the world before COVID. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for, for watching that. And as you would, you would note, you know, our experts here have set a broad agenda from 
everything will change to the world after COVID will look very much like the world before COVID, mostly as Richard Haas points out, because the world before COVID was in a lot of flux, because the world before COVID was in a lot of turmoil. So let me start the conversation between uh, with our colleagues and let me maybe start with Josh Schifferinson. Um, what do you see when you see this world in flux? Right. Uh, thank you, Adil, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. You know, when, when I look at the effects of the coronavirus and the world that will come after the pandemic is addressed in some capacity, what, what I see is, a, is an era where great power politics have been exacerbated, right? Already before coronavirus, we saw tensions rising between the U.S. and China, of course, the U.S. and Russia, uh, India and China, of course. And what coronavirus has done, what the COVID pandemic has done, is really exacerbated. It's acted as a catalyst for these tensions, right? We, we see this in the rhetoric used where China and the U.S. rather famously engaged in a Twitter war of words over who is to blame for the coronavirus. We see this in President Trump's remarks over the Chinese flu and all this, and all this uh, rhetoric. So what, what I see coming out of this is the real exacerbation of great power tensions. We're not just is there blame for the origins and the responses to the coronavirus uh, pandemic? But equally, there is a great sense of vulnerability of being too engaged with one another is a source of national security problems in the world. So great powers aren't just blaming one another. They're also recognizing or at least fearing that by engaging one another, they're leaving themselves vulnerable. So in turn, we see a push to bring some ec critical economic facilities back to the United States. We see China trying to build a large domestic economy. We see Russia closing up its borders, so on and so forth. So what this has done is act, as I mentioned, as a catalyst for these already stark differences in great power relations that were emerging before coronavirus. And now it's added this extra layer of complexity. And on top, and built into that, of course, is the notion that trust amongst these, the different leaders of these countries and the citizen rate is declining rapidly. So I see a world where great power politics and the international order that they build, it's going to be far more fractious and distrusting and far less multilateral going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Let me take that to Kaya, Kaya Shild, maybe, and, and, and you work on the state and what happens in, 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 at the state level also. One of the things at some point I might ask Josh again is the great powers have not come out looking as great as we thought they were. Right. And that's across the board, whether you look at Europe, whether you look at Asia, whether you look at right here in the US. What does all of that mean for the world we are in or the world that is being constructed for us? Thank you, Adil. Yeah, this is a fascinating conversation to have because I completely agree with uh, with Josh's ideas about great power competition. But I I would agree with you to come in and say, well, what are these great powers? You know, how much power do they have, and what kind of power do they have to enact outcomes? You know, that keep their populations safe or secure. And so um, this idea of what is state power is you know the idea of like can a state effectively um uh, change supply change chains can it can it um uh, harness resources towards a towards a vaccine can it coordinate amongst its units and what's interesting and really sobering for a lot of people is to watch you know the united states as a great power not be able to do that and uh, a lot of people have attributed attributed it accurately to political decisions. But there's also a bigger picture question going on in the last few decades about what a state is and how does it how does it conceive its role, especially in comparison to markets. And I and others have observed that there's a real hollowing out of state capacity, even in the most powerful states, even when they're spending a lot of money. And this is caused by a declining tax base, also choosing to let markets um, make decisions in areas or giving things away to markets that used to be taken care of by states. And um, states, um, you know, what does a state do? It is uh, an, an entity. Not everybody thinks about states the way a political scientist does, you know, every day. But it's an entity that really, you know, absorbs risk for long-term planning. It provides public goods like health and security. It's also a neutral broker in markets, you know, to broker and allow markets to thrive. And in all these ways, states have kind of been... Um, 
getting undermined, but also choosing not to do the things they used to do. And so this this COVID scenario, we've watched it play out this spring and summer in terms of what the United States appeared to be unable to do in terms of the public good of, of health provision. And what I would love to talk about today is how this is not just in health, where it is actually in security institutions and other institutions too, there's a hollowing out. And what I would like to do is have a conversation about that before we have a wake up call in security as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. And we're going to we're going to get to get exactly to that. You know, the point you were making is something that many of our experts, including our our, our former colleague Andy Besovich, kind of makes that sort of this questioning of uh, of of what makes people secure. In some ways, we have demonstrated the ability to wipe each other out many times over, even even with fairly small states. But in comes this little pathogen that's not even actually a living creature. Uh, and here we are all sort of hiding in our homes is, is kind of how he puts it. But, but the point really is, is also that the, this COVID moment is no longer just about COVID, you know, as Kaya said, it's, it's that, that might be what's defining what we are doing, but it's changing a lot of things that were already there or exacerbating, accelerating a lot of things that were going to happen maybe in 10 years, they happen in 10 months. Nora, from your vantage point, what, what do you see? Yeah, thank you. I, I, I want to pick up on a question that um, Kaya posed, which is, you know, this this whole situation raises question of, of questions about what a state is and how does it conceive of its role. And I want to take that up from the perspective of one of the fundamental functions of statehood is to control borders, to um, monopolize the legitimate movement and, and regulate that. And one of the things that we've seen is this uh, massive shock where uh, Every state, with, with very few exceptions, closed their borders, closed the, the inward and outward movements. Um, and what we've seen is that has created all sorts of unintended consequences um, for actually making people stuck out of place and um, preventing them from, from getting access to healthcare or going back to their homes. And so I think that it's a very, uh, in moments of high uncertainty, in moments of scarcity, the impulse, both from the, the perspective of governments and the perspective of societies, is to try to mitigate those risks by um, using migrants as the scapegoats. And in, in terms of conceiving, you know, how does a state conceive of its role? The, the, we understand that this role and the obligations and responsibilities to be mostly for citizens. And so migrants become a really easy way of solving those questions by uh, detaining people, deporting them, putting them in refugee camps. And I would just like to, to you know, if there's one message I want to, to um, push, it's that the, the impulse might be to be exclusionary, but it's absolutely critical that at this moment, we are, we conceive of inclusion in the maximum possible way. And I, I mean that not just from a perspective of human rights or, um, you know, containing this pathogen and, and developing a global response to it, but also from a perspective of security um, and paying attention to the, the need to actually make sure that people have documents that they can legally travel um, because there's going to be such a um, downstream uh, emergence of unintended consequences if we don't pay attention to that. Thank you. Thank you for that, for that. And I should note for those of you who are watching live right now, please do um, tell us if you have any questions. You can, in the chat function, which should be on the right hand of your screen, you can write out your questions and we will try to the extent we can to bring those into the conversation. And and maybe, Kaya, if I can come back to you before I go to, go to Josh, uh, Nora is also raising this issue of sort of what does security mean? In some ways, all of you have, have, have raised that. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, and and part of it is this sort of exclusionary impulse, how quick it was certainly surprised me also, how strong it was. And part of me wonders, are these habits going to go away? We also kind of learned how quickly we can actually undo processes that we thought were just so permanently baked in. But any thoughts on sort of beyond, beyond the health, as you said? So when you think beyond health, what, what are the type of things you're looking at either in regions or, or globally? Um, when I'm looking beyond health, um, I'm looking at, uh, so what Nuda just said is really um, interesting because it somewhat it, uh, 
contradicts what I said about the hollowing out of government institutions, because we see some government institutions like border control looking as powerful as they ever have, right? Um, and so I, I think that's absolutely true that there's a lot of, we see a lot of um, state behavior that looks really powerful, right? But um, what I've noticed is that even beyond health, uh, you have a real weakening of um, the ability of states to do things like, um, well, I mean, I think immediately about national security. We actually have not had national security crises um, in the uh, global north uh, for a little while, but those could unfold with an even um, even more quickly than the than the than the COVID crisis unfolded. I'm thinking of the fact that once the president tested positive overnight, we actually sent our um, nuclear bombers up in the air last night um, because of the fact that something like that could escalate more rapidly <laughs> right now. And so these are all terribly interconnected issues, of course, but overnight we had a chain of command national security crisis that involved whether or not um, an adversary could see this as a window, or at least it's a standard operating procedure to do so. Um, but these are the things I immediately think of is um, I immediately go towards national security issues and those events are um, less frequent, but would potentially unfold with even greater complexity and speed than the COVID crisis unfolded. Josh, can I throw this back at you? Any of the things you heard that you would react to in any which way? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, so, so, you know, I, I share Kaya's focus on national security concerns, first and foremost. Um, but I guess I look at the coronavirus pandemic, the world after coronavirus, and I actually think it, think it tells us something about what states value when it comes to national security. And Adel, you hinted at this in your remarks over, we've been on lockdown now for nine, ten, going on 10 months. Um, what this tells me is once upon a time, states felt zero, great powers, major states felt zero compunction fighting major wars where hundreds of thousands of people died. And that was just taken as part and parcel of world politics. Now, in response to a coronavirus, in response to a virus uh, that has killed fewer people than would be killed in most wars, society has basically shut itself down. So this, and policymakers have embraced this message. So this tells me that there's been some kind of weird, and I don't fully understand it. I'm going to use the phrase weird because I don't understand it, but I don't mean it in a pejorative way. There's some there's something unforeseen about what a prior what a democratization of individual safety has occurred, where policymakers so now value the lives of their citizenry that numbers that once upon a time would just, would just be taken as par for the course of world politics are really a focal point, really a lodestone of what people mean by security. And I guess the other, the other point I found interesting in response to Nora, or uh, building off of Nora's point, is, you're, Nora, you are 100% right in my view. We, we are blaming migrants and responding to that and, and responding in that way. Uh, I guess it just reminds me, though, that there's always been rally around the flag effects. There's always been an attempt in national security crises to blame the other. Right. And, and, and your remarks actually had me thinking what this reminds me of is not so much. Yes, the migrant aspect is new, but this reminds me of nothing so much as the Japanese internment of World War II, right, blaming some other group for a national in response to a national security crisis. So in a way, the world today has its analogs in the world prior. I, I, this is this is this is fascinating, and I, this is not a question for anyone. So please jump in wherever. I do want to get into the conversation. Also, some thought into what this might mean for different parts of the world. You know, I mean, when you say great powers, you've sort of reduced it to some. But you know, there is there is a big planet. There is 180, 90 countries here with very different experiences. And what will they come out? And I listen to you and I listen to others, you know, people like Richard Haas of all people saying, we need to rethink sovereignty, yeah. right? Uh, people like Fukuyama, end of history, saying, I've never seen a time when I can't tell you what politics will be in six months, right? Is this really such a dramatic moment? Or is it that because we are living personally in it, we are exaggerating it in our minds. I, I can jump in here. I think that's an excellent question. And in terms of 
uh, you know, as we're discussing what this means from national security, I think, and who's a great power versus not, I think it raises questions about, you know, what is the nature of national security, and what are the tools, and and what are what's the arsenal of weaponry, uh, so to speak, that allows a state to be powerful or not. And in a moment like this, I think it really reminds us that we can't think of national security without thinking about interior control. Um, and interior security and interior policing. And from that perspective, I see we, I, I, we see a very wide variation in how states have responded to, to these crises based on their existing infrastructures for things like identity management or interior controls. And so that's where I see, you see the developing world having um, a, a larger issue in terms of having the infrastructure to really reach individuals um, or check IDs, um, and, and which is a, it's something we just assume um, as part of state power without realizing how infrastructural power of the state is really key for um, responding to things like a, a pandemic or really just any of, of, the, of the state functions. And so, you know, a wide variation. And I think it, coming back to the United States, you see this, this kind of disjuncture between having the most powerful weapons in the world, having the, being able to project this power, but then not necessarily having the domestic interior controls that are necessary to control internal movement and respond more effectively to something like a pathogen. Yeah. And then that, that goes well to what Kaya was also saying, this sort of, it's not a duality that in some things states has turned out to be very effective. And then in other things, suddenly we find we 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 are not. The numbers also change. I I I want to open it up again, but with the, it was interesting to me how quickly a trillion dollars appeared um, for things for which, frankly, a billion couldn't have come up uh, as uh, recently as six months ago. But but Kaya, thoughts, uh, including on any of these? Yes. Um... I was actually just going to um, say that um, one observation I have when you were saying these big questions like the end of sovereignty, what, 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 is, what, a, what, is, what does the state look like? What do politics look like? It reminds me of the fact that this um, <clears throat> boundary, especially in the United States, this boundary between internal and external, the idea of internal freedoms and external you know, uh, security or defense um, is pretty, um, rare and might never be seen again. You know, it might, we might look back at it as a um, product of the 20th century. The fact that in the place like the United States, you could have internal freedoms and very low state kind of surveillance and things like that. Um, <clears throat> because those two things go together. You know, people have talked about how, you know, you'd have to have more surveillance. Certain kinds of states are able to control COVID better because of their internal controls. And so um, other states, you know, especially um, states that have had um, a lot of um, external um, influence from other states have never had this, this luxury of, um, of thinking about internal security as um, as something they can control or as something distinct, right? And so- That's a, that, that's a scary thought. <laughs> We have a lot of scary thoughts right now, but that's what it makes me think of. Sovereignty is the ability of the state to kind of let its citizens um, be internally. In the United States, we have Fourth Amendment protections that are quite rare, you know, in terms of surveillance. But yeah, I, I see those things as vulnerable and potentially um, a blip in the future. Josh, I, I look at you and I, I, I really want to ask you, are we overdoing it? Are, are, are we overdoing? Are we over, overestimating the importance of this moment, or is it actually? You know, I, I was thinking back to a Victor Hugo line, right? Every generation thinks it's it will leave its mark upon the world. So I, I, I do sometimes wonder if we aren't making a mountain out of a molehill, but which I, I certainly don't mean the pandemic is a molehill. What I simply mean is I, I, I wonder, to your very point, is this really going to be a revolutionary moment? Because one thing. Uh, in response to Kaya, I would just say we see massive pushback over in the United States over government controls already. And we see different countries around the world choosing, you know, I, I, to make light of the situation, because I have scary thoughts too, I call it different flavors of ice cream, right, in terms of how much government surveillance they want. Um, and Adel, to your earlier point, I think that also highlights how we're going to see some stark differences in different parts of the world where different countries around the world having embraced different degrees of balancing state security and kind of keeping the virus under control in individual liberty 
are not just going to build on those tendencies over time, but I also think it's going to affect economic recovery. It's going to affect trust in government uh, infrastructure, trust in the government itself, and also affect the quality of international relations. So it, it, as you were hinting at, different states have done, di have done well in different ways or poorly in different ways. And that's going to have some long-term trajectories. I want to I want to pick up on that because I think this point will come, and uh, especially that because the, the the experience has been very different in different yes. countries, different countries will also come out very differently. That's right. In their abilities and their capabilities and their resources, but also to Kaya's point on Sunday, we will be talking about uh, values. What this has done to that as well as sort of social movements and so on and so forth and hear from apart from others from our new colleague Ibram Kendi on, on how it might have actually also re-galvanized that, that urge not to get into the surveillance state, uh, which I think Kaya is right in saying that that habit is, is also one that, that, that will happen. But let me use this moment to actually show one more uh, video clip about the same length, just over two minutes, which actually uh, resounds around a number of things you've already mentioned. So if my colleagues can cue that one up, uh, what has been happening to uh, international cooperation to multilateralism? It's just the sheer pathetic lack of leadership, global leadership. I hear a lot of voices now talking about the death of the UN. The biggest mistake that the Western countries have been making has been to weaken institutions of global governance when in fact we needed stronger institutions of global governance. Where is the global response? What is the global response? There isn't a global response. Unfortunately, we are living in a world where multilateralism, symbolized and represented by the United Nations, is under serious attack. The fact that institutions must evolve, must be reformed, is without question. The UN is not a perfect project, but a project it is. My fear is that we go into some dystopian nightmare of super individualism. In reality, it's not going to work. The leaders of the world really need to rethink sovereignty. Sovereignty can't be an absolute. I don't think business as usual will be the result, as much as countries want that. There's clearly a retreat from the kind of hyper-globalized world economy uh, that we've built since the 1990s. Do we see an end to globalization? No, but we will see basically a version 2.0, which will have a much more strategic character. We need to collaborate to meet 21st century challenges, to manage what I call the butterfly defect of globalization. And yet what we're seeing is an increasing political fragmentation, indeed the danger of a Cold War 2.0. I think people will realize as never before how important it is to have a capable state. The countries that have gotten this right um, don't fall into any one category. It's not big or small countries. It's not rich or poor countries, nor is it democratic or authoritarian countries. It's really about countries that have leadership. This time is time not for fearful leaders in an international system, which is directed, designed for the interests of people, not private power. It's not easy to attain, but it's possible. So there, there we are, there we are. Another set of um, fairly strong statements. Now we might have also selected the strong statements here, but they resound very much with what, what you are saying. Anyone can pick up, but you know, as I was listening to you, I was reminded again of what Kaya had said about the state and Michael Barber, who was uh, Tony Blair's sort of implementer in chief saying, we are going to come to a place where we will recognize state capacity to do things, to implement, to actually make change is going to be more important than ever. And maybe that is the lesson, you know, from not just New Zealand, but from Vietnam, right? That, that whichever place your capacity comes from, and it can come in strange, strange ways. Uh, any thoughts on that or anything else that, that you've heard? Kaya, can I throw it first to you? Take it whichever way you want. The, um, <clears throat> the thing that immediately came to mind when I saw those series of fantastic statements was 
Um, I heard a lot of really good thinkers saying what will happen next with all this interconnectedness and hyper-globalization, but with kind of a political retreat on the part of states wanting to cooperate. And I know that I didn't hear the whole interviews, but from at least that that clip, it made me it made me think that people were saying that this is unprecedented. And it's absolutely not unprecedented. Um, we have seen eras of extreme interconnectedness and globalization in terms of interdependence with state retreat and with an unwillingness for states to cooperate with each other to get out of the problem. And I immediately think of the gold standard um, as something that tied, you know, this, this, this monetary um, policy that tied states together to the value of gold and to each other that they couldn't get out of, you know, and that they didn't try to cooperate amongst each other, but they each had political responses to. And so there, there have been eras of extreme interdependence, you know, in the most you know, fundamental forms that have led to, I mean, I don't want to say how badly that turned out, you know, because it basically, a lot of, you know, very classic scholars say that, 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 fueled um, fascism, it fueled authoritarianism, it fueled war, this interconnectedness without cooperation. And so those are the things I worry about. Yeah, yeah. And, and those, are, those are very similar to what some of them were also worried about, that whenever we've seen it, we've also sort of tended to see really bad things, uh, bad things happen. Uh, but, but Nora, uh, you want to jump in? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, I, I want to come back to our mission as a school, which is um, a human progress, right? Advancing human progress, which is not the same as national progress. And I think that at this moment, when we want control, um, nations become a very, um, you know, seductive um, mode of operating. Let's close our borders. Let's just think about putting our own citizens first. We can't save the whole world. We can't. And, and I think that a, um, a moment like this one reminds us that there is no such thing as being able to only have national progress without thinking about a broader global project. Um, and it, it's uh, so it, it's just a reminder that in the short term, the impulse to, to think in terms of national um, progress is going to be the highest. Um, but it, especially when we're thinking big, big picture structural change on, on a global um, sphere, it, it, this is the moment for multilateralism. There's no way of responding to something like a pandemic individually within just one state. But as, as David Miliband said there, and Josh, this is for you, where is the global response? There is no global response, right? In this most global moment of at least my life, Right? I, I can't imagine a crisis that is just definitionally so global by the nature of it. The first thing to go missing was not just multilateralism, but even international cooperation, you know, not just, not just the UN, but even in the EU, Germany and France saying, as Vivian Schmidt reminded us, to Italy at right in March, hold on, guys, <laughs> not right now, because we don't know what's going to happen to us. No, it, it's been absolutely shocking in some ways how quickly, you, how quickly traditional issue, how quickly tra even issues that traditional rivals could cooperate on has gone out the window, right? Even at the height of the prior Cold War, there was U.S.-Soviet cooperation on health and human issues, right? And that is exactly the opposite of what we're seeing today, whether it be U.S. and China, or even, as you were saying, Idle, France and Germany vis-a-vis -vis Italy, vis-a-vis -vis Poland and beyond. And so I actually look at this and I go back and I think Kaya's point is very well taken. What we're going to see coming out of this will be a, an increased world of different regions or, a, or an increased world of different pockets of cooperation. And when I say different pockets of cooperation, I mean traditional axes along which states cooperated and bound themselves together are going to be a little different than the past. And I don't know yet what those axes are going to be. But if you had said 100 years ago, there's a Franco-German axis you know, that cooperates against problems in Europe, people would have laughed you out of the room. And yet that's exactly what we see. I suspect we're going to see something similar in North America, I would not be surprised at all if we see something similar occurring in and around Asia, East Asia, Eurasia, however one wants to put that. Um, so to go to the theme of this panel, I think many of the cleavages around which cooperation is going to be defined is gonna be far more localized and it's gonna be smaller in, in global, smaller in scope. 
and the boundary lines are going to be totally novel. So that's a very good segue for all of you. I, I did want to come to, we have, we've been talking this 40,000 feet sort of really global, but what does it mean? Not just even at the local, but at the national regional level, right? So China, US is clearly one thing, right? We, we did a hundred videos, only one of them was on China, but nearly 70 of them talked about China. It didn't matter what the question was. The answer was China rise, US, what does that mean for a whole host of anything? Right in the EU, for example, Kaya, we spoke to Enrico Letta, the former prime minister of Italy, and he said, you know, what we do today will decide whether tomorrow there's an EU. I don't know how 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 whether that's dramatic or not, but it's big in in the Middle East, for example. Uh, Wali Nasser saying governments will fall, the US will be out. Uh, what do you guys see? Who who, who wants to start? Um, Kaya, where is the EU uh, or the European Union or the European project? Uh, which was already sort of, you know, with Brexit and stuff, if I can, if I can maybe ask you to say a word or two about that. Well, what's interesting about the EU is it's kind of like um, this zombie-like entity, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that it survives out of crisis. Maybe that's not the right metaphor, but it gets stronger um, it, it has shown to get stronger in crisis. Many have noted this. Um, it, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily um, you know, uh, exactly the kind of EU you want to see, but Brexit actually um, strengthened the EU on multiple dimensions. It brought together a more core group of states. It actually um, increased public opinion um, at positively towards the EU on the continent. Um, and it fueled, it was one of the things that fueled a more defense cooperation in Europe. Um, there's a couple of different reasons for this, fewer actors, you know, power was distributed more equally maybe. Also, you know, it coincided with, uh, you know, bad neighborhood events, you know, like uh, actual um, uh, conflicts on its borders, but it has strengthened um, as an institution, you know, in terms of popular opinion, et cetera. I mean, there's a different, couple different ways you could say it strengthened. And most people predicted the opposite. People have been predicting the death of the EU for quite a while now. And then um, in the COVID crisis, um, I'm not trying to say rah, rah, everything's perfect, but in the COVID crisis, you actually saw a lot of, let's say pro-social behavior on the part of states and, um, I haven't seen public opinion data just from the last few months as one indicator, but it appears that the, that the European project is as strong as ever, even though you had um, really early crisis inflection points for the EU. Thank you. Good, good point, actually. I should note that the letter and Rico letter statement I mentioned, we interviewed him back in April, and the European project in September or October is already very different from whatever it was in April as sort of this was really blowing up uh, around Mediterranean Europe and so on and so forth. Um, Nora, what do you see? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, to, to take up this question in the Middle East. And, and I, I think what we see is just a huge amount of variation in how states have responded. And also the redrawing of new factions and new regional alliances that w in my own lifetime, even 10 years ago, we would have said that this, this would have never happened. And so I, I think that when, again, I come back to um, notions of state infrastructure and security apparatuses and, um, you know, with which state, the states that already had an infrastructure for surveillance, for um, kind of tracking people, uh, ha ended up sort of having greater control over uh, combating the virus. Whereas places like Yemen, places like Syria, places like Iraq, which were already war-torn and dealing with much larger um, co uh, conflict zones are now seeing, you know, going back to, it's not just healthcare, we're talking about uh, mass starvation. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, often when we're thinking like, you know, the EU is this region or the, Europe is this region, Middle East only, we only kind of think of this as a region um, because of British naval strategy in World War II. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's easy to group these, these countries together without really thinking about how different um, they are and how we're redrawing new alliances um, and new rivalries within the region. Mm -hmm. Josh, thoughts from you? Is this really Cold War 2.0? But clearly US-China is in the news uh, for reasons that were already there, but exacerbated much more prominently 
uh, in these last months of lockdown? No, so, so it's a huge question. Is this Cold War 2.0? Um, I'm reluctant to call it a Cold War 2.0 uh, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, number one, I don't see the degree of ideological hostility between the US and China still there. Yes, there are rival modes of governance and even surveillance at home, obviously, but there's not this ideological fervor that seems to drive, that seems to be, def that seems to be crucial to the definition of a Cold War. And even in traditional national security terms, the scope of the US-China militarized relationship is not quite what it was at the uh, even in the heyday of the U.S. Soviet competition, what I do think we're seeing, though, and this is what I meant earlier by the effect of the coronavirus pandemic on U.S.-Chinese relations, is kind of a return to traditional, by which I mean pre-1945, uh, notions of great power competition and rivalry. Where I think what we're seeing is cooperation on some issues, which we forget there is U.S.-Chinese cooperation still on North Korea to a lesser extent on Iran's nuclear program and yet a breakdown of cooperation on other issues such as coronavirus today. Uh, and we see as well the withdrawing of deep interconnectedness on economic issues. So what I think we're seeing is a regression towards the, in, towards the uh, tr historical mean, right? It's the return of great power competition without there necessarily being a Cold War. In some ways, it, what's happening, I, I, what, in the back of my mind, I think what's happening is where the blinders of unipolarity of American hegemony are being lifted. And we're, we're reminding ourselves that there is some baseline competition at great power politics uh, in international affairs. Thank you. And, and again, for those who are watching, if you do have questions, please, please uh, feel, feel free, welcome to put them in as we get into our sort of last quarter of this, uh, maybe, we turn and look towards what's ahead. Uh, you know, we, 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 I used to think of the world after COVID. I'm now convinced there is no such thing. There is a world that COVID has created and is creating that we are already in and will evolve. But as you look at that world, um, maybe the question, you know, I sometimes ask our students, what's the biggest hope you have and what is the biggest fear you have? As, as, as you look ahead, who wants to go first? Nora? Yeah, I mean, when you said, what's the biggest fear I had, I can get really dark, so, <laughs> um, so let's be careful. I mean, I think, let me start with the fear and then let me, uh, I'll end on a, on a more positive note of the, of the hope. I think my biggest fear <clears throat> is that what we're going to do is see again the closing of these borders the villainization of particular populations and then s slowly the impulse to not include to um you know not allow um migrants to have legal rights creating more and more um, pressures towards human trafficking, um, not allowing people to register births because they're not in the right space, creating more and more statelessness. And so my worst fear is that we're actually going to end up in a post-pandemic uh, uh, post world where um, some people are documented and have passports and have IDs and, and can re-enter um, society or be part of society, and others are going to be unenumerable, un illegible to, to state institutions. And that, that to me is, is really frightening because, and that's where I say it's a security issue. Uh, we might say, get out of my borders, but where are people going to go? And so um, uh, for me, that's the worst fear is to create these um, bulges of people who are stuck in refugee camps who are start in detention centers where we're really eliminating a, a lot of the, the the kind of obligations that even the leaders of the free world, the leaders of the international human rights framework are, are abandoning in certain instances. So that, that's worst case scenario. I think it's also a moment of hope because I don't think that the exclusionary impulse is just a natural impulse. I think it's learned. I think it comes from fear and it comes from fear mongering. And so the messaging that we have today the, the reminders that it's not just a, a question of, um, you know, a, a zero sum game of inclusion or exclusion becomes really important. And so my hope is actually that this moment we've also seen protests about a high, a racial hierarchy, about exclusion. And so the, the decisions we make today about how inclusive or exclusionary we're going to be will have a huge impact uh, on um, our post-COVID world. 
any of the others? And again, in terms of hope, not necessarily because the moment is hopeful, but what would we hope for if we could, um, that could come out of this? Josh or Kaya? I'll, I'll jump in on this because I also think one of the questions that was just posed to us, I, I can speak to a little bit. You know, my fear is the growing and growing atomization of politics, right? Where we already see in, uh, us as political actors turning towards smaller units than in times past, the nation and supposed to the globe. And you can imagine that continuing all the way down where it becomes the localized state or the localized county or the localized town or just one's familial group or neighborhood. And that's a real concern going forward. But that's also, I think, uh, a possibility of hope for the future, right? If, if one can find ways of recognizing that hey, this atomization, this phenomenon of turning inward and turning solely upon oneself and what one knows is actually a major source of the problem. Then looking forward, I see a possibility, I see a moment of hope of being to overcome some of, the, some of these narrow definitions of what provides security. And so in response to those questions, the lack of international cooperation and the indictment of nationalism I think it's less an indictment of nationalism and more a call for a new conception of nationalism uh, as the state must be secure, but security itself can be driven by other forms of cooperation, can come from forms of cooperation. And that's what I think of as a hopeful uh, sign amidst the pandemic. Very good. And you were obviously sort of referring to, we had a question from Samantha Miller about nationalism, and we have another one. Uh, I, I'll say one about one of them, which is about climate change and, and highlight that on our panel tomorrow, we'll be talking actually at great depth on that in terms of, uh, so, so the fact that it doesn't come up is not because it's not considered important, but because there are so many tomorrow, we'll be focusing quite a lot on, on, on climate and development and um, uh, in, in, in that. So I hope you'll join us for that. But, uh, but, but Kaya, nationalism was, was, was mentioned. And I think some of our other questions that are now pouring in quickly, all get to this question of, you know, some of the words we maybe haven't used as much. They're using words like, you know, Adash uses the word xenophobia, authoritarianism, what's happening to governments and so on and so forth. How does, how do those things sort of feature on your ra radar in terms of the politics that is happening or will happen in, in the near future? So I'm going to try to streamline my thinking because I was really picking up on some of these questions and some of the comments of my colleagues. But the thing that I was just thinking as these questions about climate change came in, <clears throat> as these questions about international cooperation came in and thinking about the, um, the interesting things my colleagues were saying <clears throat> is that I'm thinking about this as a moment, right? Um, if you think about how major, um, uh, legislation happens, um, whether it's um, civil rights kind of legislation or whether it's major environmental legislation. These are post crises. Um, they don't just kind of, um, you know, it, it requires a major kind of societal disruption in, in some way or major social movements. Um, and it doesn't just happen when times are good. You know, these are, these are politics of scarcity and crisis when, when big good reforms happen. Like if you wanted a Green New Deal or a Global New Deal, there would, you know, it's, we're not just going to like um, kind of cheerlead our way into that. Um, there, it usually happens post crisis. And so I'm not saying we want a crisis, you know, the, the crises this year and the crises to come are, are bad. Um, but what I'm trying to say is, is that there's a possibility here. If you want the state to, you know, do better, and if you want collections of states and global governance to do better, um, they're going to have to grab some power back and do things better together. And that's going to be a fight. There are going, there are constituencies in the United States, quite literally, like if the, you know, if the, if the government wanted to do um, vaccine coordination better, they're going to have to take away profits from major industries. And that's going to be a fight. And so if you take that up to all these different levels, there's going to be a major fight. But a major fight means major opportunity, right? Um, it, there's an opportunity here to, you're going to piss people off, you know, if you want to create some better legislation and there's a possibility of, um, of, of big changes when they happen. And the next thing I was gonna say is just that the international institutions we have are, are um, relics frozen in time, you know, from 1945. And um, I, 
I think that this is a moment to rethink these international institutions, um, at least in terms of their governing power. I mean, I don't even know where the impetus for this comes from, but perhaps it comes from, from um, you know, a declining U.S. and the U.S. abdicating its role a little bit more. So that's all over the place, but that's because I was so stimulated by everything coming in the next in the last few minutes. Sure. Yes, actually, as am I, we have a number of these questions and I'm so grateful for them. We'll get, if we don't get them to them today, we certainly will try to tomorrow and day after. This is a continuing conversation and, and, and we will, but, but in, our, in our last uh, like nine minutes, uh, I, I, I want to sort of get back to at least some of the questions, but also keep, keep looking forward. Again, on the darker note, David and actually a couple of other people also kind of are pointing out or asking uh, in a way, not only about the state and international, but the voter, if will, will it strengthen the demand for authoritarianism for strong governments who can sort of, you know, just take charge? Uh, on the other hand, we've seen actually, you know, again, the cases that shine are New Zealand. Uh, the cases that shine are Vietnam. Um, what do you think will, will be the shadow of this experience? on what people ask of their leaders, right? This is, this is sort of, uh, Nora, you want to go first or anyone or, or take it yeah. wherever you want. I, I'd love to go first. And, you know, I, I want to just read out the question because I think it was a, a really good one that was posed from our audience member, which is, would you agree that COVID has perhaps provided a platform to authoritarian and right-wing governments to further their anti-immigrant and xenophobic policies? And Absolutely, yes. Um, but I want to say two things about that. One, I think we saw a move towards this uh, this um, desire for strong leadership um, and kind of more autocratic authoritarian leadership pre-COVID. Um, and, and that was kind of a global move um, in, in various parts of the world where we saw these, these more populist leaders emerge in Latin America and the Middle East and the United States and everywhere. Um, but I also want to caution against seeing this as a, as a regime type uh, difference between authoritarian states versus, versus democratic states, because the way we, we distinguish between authoritarian and democratic regimes is by their treatment of their own citizens. We don't actually look into how you treat immigrants when we make these kinds of um, regime type distinctions. And so I think that there's a, a real threat within democracies as well for, for the emergence of this uh, right wing xenophobia um, and, and for the, the erosion of really important um, protection that exist in, in democratic states. So uh, my fear is that we're going to see a sort of descent into authoritarian autocratic um, uh, states from even some of the established democracies in the world. Okay. Uh, well, maybe Josh, I'll come to you. You take it wherever, but I'm trying to also wrap up and I wanted to, as I do that, maybe as final thoughts from each of us, not forget, you know, our, our alumni are watching this, our students are watching this, we as scholars or practitioners, what does this mean for what we do at the party school? Sure. Uh, so, so, does it change what we what we do or uh, go? No, so, so, so two points. Uh, number one, I, I don't think, uh, to answer your question, Otto, that this is going to prompt a resurgence of authoritarianism. I think, and this echoes Kaya's original point, I think Nora's comments as well, what we're going to see is a far more, far more of a focus on the quality of governance delivered, right? irrespective of the regime type that delivers it. And so in that sense, what the pushback is going to be against is this notion of democracy as a wave of the future. And of course, when Fukuyama says that he doesn't know what the future is, we already kind of knew that was coming. Uh, so I think in some sense, we'll see democratic pushback, but not necessarily that rebounding into a, a tide of authoritarianism. As for what this means, though, for the party school's mission, I think this does two things. Number one, it requires us as teachers, as practitioners, as scholars to really help educate the future generations to make sense of these, of these very fractious, conflictual, and contradictory, in some sense, trends so they can go out and try to change the world. Because we're sitting here in the ivory tower, in a way. Uh, it's people on the ground who are going to be voting and doing things, going to hard places and doing hard things. And we need to train them to do that. And then number two, of course, is in my own research, I see a growing demand for work that engages this question of what do great power politics get us in terms of understanding the world around us? And, and, and what don't they explain? In other words, are we seeing a new wave of great power politics, a new wave of 
what great powers focus upon, and if not, what fills in the gaps? Kaya, two minutes, final thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to um, say that what's interesting about this world is not, you know, what democ what happens between democracies and autocracies, like what Nura was just saying. Um, and also um, that, that that's not the thing to pay attention to. I think what all of us were saying on some level is that there's something happening between like states and societies, states and markets, you know, that is very interdependent, you know, you know, with transnational, interdependent, multi-level. Um, and that this is where we're, what we're trying to pay attention to. I made comments about, you know, the relationship between the state and the market. Nura made comments about the relationship between the state and its citizens internally. You know, Josh made comments about, you know, the, the different, you know, interrelated complexities going on here in power politics. And so um, to pivot to uh, what's unique about the Pardee School and what we study well here is that we are kind of immersed in these nuances and these complexities. We are not just looking at foreign policy and the state because that is um, as what we've been saying this whole time here, that is really only just um, a tiny bit of the picture here. And even if the world um, doesn't look radically different, you know, there are reasons to think that it will on different levels, but even if different things stay the same, like the US is still a hegemon, we don't have any new international institutions, um, trends of inequality stay the same, the different causal explanations are not just about the relationship between states themselves, but in between all these really complex transnational processes. And so my colleagues, I look around and I see people who are on the forefront of understanding those trends. Fasten your seatbelts. We are condemned to live in interesting times and, 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 and there is going to be need to understand what's interesting about them and to, to make them also manageable. Noura, last words. Last words actually about our students and our responsibility to them and the challenge that we have right now. And I think that all of us, as you can tell, think of the big picture and the structural changes and how we're going to respond to this changing world. And, and I think about how do we interpret that in the classroom and how do we um, also protect the mental health of our students who are now actually at a very young age. Um, I think I do once you said we, we kind of, they're inheriting a world that we broke. <laughs> um, and so I, I know that it, it, it seems like, you know, talking about mental health when we're talking about global flux, it's absolutely important. Um, and sort of reminding, thinking very consciously about if we know that some of our daily practices, for example, are leading to structural, um, you know, challenges like climate change, how do we take that into our daily life? How do we connect the, the macro structural global politics to the way we live our daily life. And, and, and that's, I've been really proud of our students. I've been really inspired by them. Um, and I think that that's something that I'm much more conscious of um, and, and kind of take the, the, the need for taking silence, for, for, for um, being detached and, and for also uh, thinking about the, our internal strength to deal with some of these larger issues is something that we need to communicate to our students in addition to thinking about the large global politics. No, thank you. Thank you, all of you. But thank you also for ending on that note. I think we always all get inspired, all of us, by our students. Um, um, and, and, and I think sort of that's what makes what we do both so exciting, but such a great responsibility also. But we do get inspired by, by their passions. And in, in this case, by the responsibility we are putting on their shoulders. And I think those are good shoulders and that's a good thought to, to, to end on. Let me thank my, my colleagues, uh, Professor uh, Schifrensen, Professor Lori, Professor Schilde, for, for really um, interesting, important discussion that needs to continue. It continues in our classrooms here at the party school every day. It needs to continue elsewhere and I hope those who are listening will continue it and one way to continue it is to please join us again tomorrow and then again day after there was a question from Melanie Cohen for example about economics what's the role of corporations and government and that's one of the things we'll be talking about tomorrow when we will talk about uh, the future of global economics and global development and with me will be um, our colleagues Professor Kevin Gallagher, Professor Perry Merling and Professor Vivian Schmidt and then on Sunday we'll be talking about global values. So do please join us and thank you all of you for, 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 for taking the time for this conversation, for those uh, my, on my panel to participate in it and for a very active and wonderful audience uh, that kept it alive. Let us keep the conversation going.